Hello everyone. Today's gospel text consists of two parts, taken from two separate chapters from the Gospel of Luke. The first part is a brief introduction to the Gospel of Luke. From this passage, we learn that Luke had addressed the Gospel to a specific person named Theophilus. But who was Theophilus? Friends, the identity of Theophilus remains a mystery to biblical scholars. The name appears only two times in the Bible and in both times in the writings of Luke. There are many theories as to who he might have been. Theophilus is a Greek name and it means friend of God or lover of God. Some people believe that Theophilus could have been a friend of Luke either in Palestine or in Rome or even Greece. Some think that he may have been a Jewish high priest in Jerusalem. Others say that he was a Roman official in Jesus' day. Some more argue that he was a new convert who required instruction in Christian faith. Still others suggest that it was a name given to the earliest believers in Jesus or simply a title for all Christians. Friends, regardless of whoever Theophilus was and whatever his position or status, he was certainly someone who was interested in knowing about Jesus Christ. Friends, as you can tell from the style of writing, Luke was a well-educated person. He was a Greek physician from Antioch in Syria and he was a Christ follower and a traveling companion of Paul. First, Luke indicates that he was one of the many people who had undertaken to provide an account of the events that were being fulfilled among his generation. Second, Luke acknowledges that he was not himself an eyewitness to the events he was about to record and therefore he received the information from those who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Third, Luke assures Theophilus that after having researched carefully, thoroughly and accurately all the events concerning Jesus Christ, he wrote down in orderly fashion so that he might know the exact truth of what he had heard or had been taught. And then, the Gospel text jumps from chapter 1 to the end of chapter 4. Thus, it skips three chapters which describe the events leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, and Jesus' early childhood, mission and preaching of John the Baptist, the baptism, genealogy and temptation of Jesus. Friends, these passages were read during Advent and Christmas seasons. Now, the second part of today's Gospel contains Jesus' inaugural ministry. Having overcome the temptation, Jesus returned with great power to his home province of Galilee, where he would base his ministry for three years. Jesus had been given the power of the Spirit without measure, so he was able to preach the Gospel, heal the sick, cast out devils, and do many wonderful works among the people in a way no one had ever done before. However, Luke does not enumerate what Jesus so far had said or done there. Rather, he writes about Jesus' visit to Nazareth. However, according to the Gospel of John, Jesus had worked his first miracle of turning water into wine at a marriage in Cana and then, according to the Gospel of Mark, he had preached in the synagogue in Capernaum, driven out an unclean spirit, cured Simon's mother-in-law, and healed many who had various diseases, and was praised by all. Friends, in the course of time, Jesus went to his hometown Nazareth, where he had been raised. Other than a short stay in Bethlehem, and also in Egypt after his birth, Jesus had lived most of his life in Nazareth. Hardly anything is known about Jesus' life 
between his early childhood and the beginning of his ministry at about 30 years of age, except that at the age of 12 and during the Passover festival, he was found in the midst of the teachers in the temple of Jerusalem after having gone missing for three days, that he went down to Nazareth with his parents and that he was obedient to them, and that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Friends, Luke writes that during his visit to Nazareth, Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, which was said to be his custom. Even though he was the Son of God, like most Jews, he went to the synagogue every week for worship, prayer and study of the law or the scriptures. Jesus was a faithful and observant Jew. Today Nazareth is the largest Arab city in Israel and it has about 30 churches and monasteries as well as mosques and ancient synagogues. But in Jesus' time, Nazareth would have been a small Jewish village of probably not more than 300 people. And there would have been just one synagogue that served their needs. Friends, growing up there, Jesus would have gone into that synagogue many times and he would have known many of the people attending Sabbath services. Friends, as Jesus went in, he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah so that he could read and interpret it for the people. In Jesus' time, during Sabbath services, it was normal and as a sign of great respect to invite a visiting rabbi or a teacher to read the Torah. To Jesus' contemporaries, it is clear that Jesus was considered a teacher of considerable influence. Friends, Luke writes that Jesus opened the scroll and read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year acceptable to the Lord. Friends, it is important to note here that Jesus' proclamation is not a single passage from Isaiah. It is primarily a combination of two texts, Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 2 and a part of Isaiah chapter 58 verse 6. The phrase recovery of sight to the blind appears to have been inspired by Isaiah chapter 35 verse 5 or chapter 42 verse 7. All in all, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah prophetically had spoken for the Messiah who would come into the world and deliver people from sickness, suffering and death. Friends, now by citing the words of Isaiah right at the start of his ministry, Jesus was essentially saying that he was that very Messiah who had been sent to accomplish five tasks during his earthly ministry. 1. Bring glad tidings to the poor. Friends, in the Bible, poor represents not only the economically impoverished, but all those who are marginalized or excluded from human fellowship, the outcast, and those who are humble and without pride. Throughout his public ministry on earth, Jesus would emphasize God's care for the poor and the responsibility of others to care for them. Sometimes he would also miraculously provide food for hungry crowds. 2. Preach liberty to the captives. Friends, here captives refers not only to people who are in a physical prison, but also a spiritual prison, those who are unable to free themselves from the clutches of sin and the fear of death. Friends, during his ministry, besides healing the people of their physical infirmities, Jesus would free them from their spiritual bondage and oppression of the devil as well. 3. Give sight to the blind. Friends, the Bible speaks about both physical blindness and spiritual blindness. However, physical blindness is often used as a metaphor for spiritual blindness. Friends, spiritual blindness refers to losing one's spiritual sight or vision. Spiritually blind people are those who do not know or see God 
and who grope in the dark, then stray off the path that leads to life. Such people can cry out to God for help, but pride stops them from seeking the truth. Friends, in his ministry, Jesus would restore both physical and spiritual sight to lots of people. 4. Let the oppressed go free Friends, oppression can be found everywhere, in our homes, communities, workplaces and nations. And it can be political, social, racial, economic or physical. We might think, I am not really oppressed. But as a matter of fact, we all turn oppression on one another without us even knowing and we all experience it sometimes. However, Luke's use of the same Greek word aphasis for both liberty to captives and oppressed to go free in today's text and also for the forgiveness of sins and debts indicates that Jesus was referring to spiritual oppression or demonic oppression among the people. Friends, it is the work of evil spirits that urges us to sin, to deny God's word, to feel spiritually dead, to give in to the enticements of this world and to be in bondage to sinful things. The word Ephesus literally means to be shattered into pieces, to be broken hearted, to be bruised. In other words, oppression shatters who we are. It's like being broken into pieces. Friends, through his life, death and resurrection, Jesus would touch every broken area of life in a fallen world, including spiritual oppression, and would restore us so that we may live freely in his presence. 5. Announce the acceptable year of the Lord. Friends, the year does not refer to a calendar year of 365 days, but to a period of time when Israelite slaves were released after they returned the mortgaged land to its owner and had their debts forgiven. It was this acceptable year of the Lord to which Isaiah was referring, except that his application was spiritual and not material. Specifically, Isaiah was referring to a period of time in which mankind would be redeemed by Jesus Christ, when all human beings would be restored and set free. In actual fact, the year began with the death of his son on the cross, and since then God is willing to accept people or to receive sinners coming to him. Friends, finally, Jesus ended the reading by making an amazing statement. Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. By Jesus' time, many Jews had settled again in the land of ancestors, as foretold by the prophets. However, they still waited for the Messiah. It had been many centuries since God promised a Messiah to the Israelites, but now the waiting was over. Jesus declared that all Isaiah had spoken of the Messiah was being fulfilled in him on that day, and from then on he was going to fulfill all the messianic prophecies. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. The main reason that so many of us struggle with our faith is that we lack knowledge of God. As believers, we do know about salvation and baptism, but that's it. We do not truly know the God in whom we profess to have faith. This is because either we haven't been taught or we don't take the time to learn about God in the Bible or from other believers. As a result, many of us are unfortunately unable to teach others, even our children, the truth of Christian faith and to defend our beliefs. Besides, we often fall away and embrace practices that may harm and cause as our very souls. Friends, the Old Testament prophet Hosea reminds us that God's people perish for lack of knowledge of Him. Friends, as far as the knowledge of the Lord is concerned, Luke is truly a great example for us to follow. Just as Luke did, we must not stop with becoming a Christian believer, but also seek to know our Lord Jesus by the reading of God's word and confirming this 
with those who have pursued such knowledge wisely. For faith comes from hearing, and the hearing by the word of God. And at the same time, it is essential to understand that we have been anointed at baptism with grace, with the gifts and spiritual privileges, by the Holy Spirit, so as to courageously share the gospel of Jesus and guide others in faith, particularly our own children and new believers. In other words, our Christian responsibility does not stop with having our children and friends baptized and introducing them to prayers and religious rituals and practices, but also teaching them what God has placed in the Bible. Friends, we must tell them the story of Jesus accurately and also in an orderly manner and what that story means for us so that they might know the truth regarding Jesus Christ and the truth will make them free. 2. Friends, all of Isaiah's prophetic promises that Luke records and that Jesus read in the synagogue at Nazareth were fulfilled among God's people with Jesus being present. All those who were moved by faith to seek Jesus out received physical healing, spiritual insight, comfort, forgiveness, peace, freedom and joy from him whereas people who declined to approach him miss their opportunity. Friends, throughout this whole liturgical year, we will be reading in the Gospel of Luke many stories related to these fulfillments. At the same time, it is essential that we believe the same passage is fulfilled in our lives as well. We can also be confident that we will receive the same blessings as people of Jesus' day. For God desires all of us to experience His goodness and glory in a variety of ways, but it only happens through faith and submission to Him. Amen. God bless you.